Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today to do some studies in the Citizens Rulebook, which is a little pocket handbook a gentleman had made in the 1970s to help Americans know their constitution and be able to assert their rights. So we're going to read through this with a little bit of commentary. We've learned a bit since the 1970s, and I've had quite a bit of information to supplement the great work that you can find in this little book. I buy these in bulk and edit them slightly and hand them out to people. I, I recommend everybody learn this front and back and cover to cover. <clears throat> So right here, this is section one handbook for jurors. It says, the purpose of this information is to revive, as Jefferson put it, the ancient principles. It is not designed to promote lawlessness or a return to the jungle, which is a quote that George Bush Sr. had made at the United Nations, if you can recall, right, when he was talking about implementing the rule of law and not the rule of the jungle he was talking about implementing babylonian roman civil municipal law the statutory law that everyone's being subjected to as opposed to the common law which is torah or his his scripture right <clears throat> it says the ancient principle referred to the ten commandments in the common law the common law is, in simple terms, just plain common sense, and it has its roots in the Ten Commandments and in the right rulings of Scripture. Literally, you can go back to Alfred the Great's dooms, and you'll find that the common law consisted, to begin with, of the Ten Commandments, and then the right rulings from Scripture, chapters 20 through 23. Then you had a few other things from directly from scripture, including the part in the book of Acts, the book of or the epistle to Yaakov and a few other places. And then you had other rulings and, and laws that the king and the people had had established from time or since then. But the core of it is Torah. You, there's no way around that. And that is what is the foundation of government in our country. That's why I'm very adamant about saying that we have a covenant with our creator with our constitutional republic and we're violating that covenant when we commit treason with this whole system that's going on this is in 1776 we came out of bondage with faith or belief comprehension and courage even against great odds and with much bloodshed we battled our way to achieve liberty. Liberty is that delicate area between the force of government and free will of man. Liberty brings freedom of choice to work, to trade, to go and live wherever one desires or wishes. It leads to abundance. Abundance, if made an end in itself, will result in complacency which leads to apathy. Apathy is the let George do it philosophy. This always brings dependency. For a period of time, dependents are often not aware that they are dependent. They delude themselves by thinking they are still free. We never had it so good. We can still vote, can't we? Eventually, Abundance diminishes and dependency becomes known by its true nature, bondage. There are few ways out of bondage. Bloodshed and war are often result. But our founding fathers learned of a better way, realizing that a creator is always above and greater than that which he creates. They established a three-vote system by which an informed citizenry can control those acting in the name of government. To be a good master, you must always remember the true pecking order or chain of command in this nation. Number one, Yahuwah Elohim created man. 
Two, man created the Constitution. Three, the Constitution created government. Four, the government created corporations, etc. <clears throat> The base of power was to remain in we the people, who are the, the rightful kings of the country. We're collectively kings, but we're only governing ourselves in our own household, which is the pinnacle of what and the essence of what kingship is all about. That you can find all the way back from the making of the Septuagint in what's called the letter of Aristes, which I recently shared. And I think I put an email for you guys, but I'll share that with you again. <clears throat> it says the base of power was to remain in we the people, but unfortunately, it was lost to those leaders acting in the name of government, such as politicians, bureaucrats, judges, lawyers, etc. And we're going to show in the course of time, we're probably going to do another video series throughout the week. One of them is going to be on exposing just who is behind the overthrow of our country. And it's the Jesuits. If you want to know, the remnant of our creator is a theme that you can see throughout scripture. It's the remnant that he does everything for. His chosen precious ones that he'll deliver even the wicked nation on account of them. And they're the ones that have the gifts of the Ruach that are able to do foretellings, his foretellers, his all the people of the renewed covenant times have the gifts in that same capacity. And the reverse of that, the adversary has witchcraft and he gives that to those that draw close to him in a parallel or in a perversion of the gifts of the Ruach. The Jesuit order is the remnant within Catholicism of the most precious of his type that do his will without deviation. That you can start to see the picture behind that. It's the, the perversion of what is good and right to the extreme. And that is the responsible party, Satan through his minions for the overthrow of our country. We're going to show you in uh, <clears throat> another time about that. This is as a result, America began to function like a democracy instead of a republic. A democracy is dangerous because it is a one vote system as opposed to a republic, which is a three vote system. You also have the difference that a democracy is majority rule. It's mob rule. And the republic is ruled by law where you have limited government that it can only function with it within the bonds that it's given they're not permitted to go beyond the bonds given to them but in a democracy you can vote yourself more of anything so long as you're on the majority rule the three votes to check tyranny not just one american citizens have not been informed of their other two votes our first vote is at the polls on election day when we pick those who are to represent us in the seats of government. And that's the first issue that they get us at because what you're doing when you register to vote is you're partaking of a corporate fiction that is usurping our constitutional republic. You're not voting for the president of the republic, you're voting for the CEO of their corporation. That's why a non American could run and get the office. That's why a non-American can be the vice president of it. <clears throat> it's not following the same rules. They just, they expect us to be ignorant of these things and to continue partaking of treason by being in that system. There's also some that are realizing this and they're getting out of it and they're trying to start their own state assemblies or bringing up their militias and forming grand juries and doing other things. And while I commend those, we have to do it from the people and not join cults or cliques and different sects to do that. But we have everything we need within the constitution itself. We just need to educate ourselves and implement it. it says, but what can be done if those elected officials just don't perform as promised or expected? 
While the second two votes are the most effective means by which the common people of any nation on earth have ever had in controlling those appointed to serve them in government. Now, we also have the means of forming at will common law grand juries investigating any type of fraud, corruption, or violations of the Constitution and indicting criminals to have them tried and thrown in prison. There's nothing permitting or forbidding us from doing this except for our ignorance and lack of courage, literally. So it, it just takes better education on our part. <clears throat> It says our first vote is at the polls. I already read that one. The second vote's the most effective by which we already read that one. Sorry, too. My apologies. The second vote comes when you serve on a grand jury. Before anyone can be brought to trial for a capital or infamous crime by those acting in the name of government, permission must be obtained from people serving on a grand jury. The Minneapolis Star and Tribune in the March 27, 1987 edition noted a purpose of the grand jury this way. A grand jury's purpose is to protect the public from an overzealous prosecutor. The third is the most powerful vote. <clears throat> this is when you are acting as a jury member during a courtroom trial. At this point, the buck stops with you. It is in this setting that each juror has more power than the president, all of Congress, and all of the judges combined. Congress can legislate or make law. <clears throat> the president or some other bureaucrat can make an order or issue regulations. And judges may instruct or make a decision. But no juror can ever be punished for voting not guilty. Any juror can, with impunity, choose to disregard the instructions of any judge or attorney in rendering his vote. If only one juror should vote not guilty for any reason, there is no conviction and no punishment at the end of the trial. Thus, those acting in the name of government must come before the common man to get permission to enforce the law. You are above the law. As a juror in a trial setting, when it comes to your individual vote of innocence or innocent or guilty, you truly are answerable to El Shaddai or only to El Shaddai, El Almighty. <clears throat> The First Amendment to the Constitution was born out of this great concept. However, judges of today refuse to inform jurors of their rights. The Minneapolis Star and Tribune in a newspaper article appearing in its November 30th, 1984 edition, entitled What Judges Don't Tell the Jurors, stated, At the time of the adoption of the Constitution, the jury's role as defense against political oppression was unquestioned in American jurisprudence, meaning the right of the people as a last line of defense against oppressive government was known and implemented. We, it was the whole reason why we have trial by jury and why we fought and had these things enumerated and put in the Constitution, as you'll see here in a minute. This nation survived, or sorry, yeah, this nation survived until the 1850s when persecutions under the Fugitive Slave Act, it's supposed to be notion, right? But when prosecutions under the Fugitive Slave Act was largely unsuccessful because jurors refused to convict, then judges began to erode the institution of free juries leading to the absurd compromise that is the current state of the law. And it was around the 1850s when you had the full Catholic overthrow of our country being culminated. They finally had the numbers to start putting all their people in places, flocking into the cities and outvoting the non-Catholics to put people in positions of power. And that's why after the Civil War, things were happening in a rapid scale to our detriment and we lost 
one liberty after another, after one right after another, in a seemingly consecutive cascade of uh, usurpations to go along with distractions, calamities, and other things to keep us from paying attention to what's going on. Kind of like what you see today, but it was a lot, it's a lot more extreme now with the internet. It says, <clears throat> while our courts uniformly state jurors have the power to return a verdict of not guilty, whatever the facts, they routinely tell the jurors the opposite. Further, the courts will not allow the defendants or the, their counsel to inform the jurors of their true power. A lawyer who made Hamilton's argument would face professional discipline and charges of contempt of court. And that's because we're not using common law courts anymore, but they're running under admiralty law or civil municipal statutes. And that's not the common law, but it's satanic, literally, from Babylon. <clears throat> By what logic should juries have the power to acquit a defendant? But no right to know about the power. The court's decisions that have suppressed the notion of jury nullification cannot resolve this paradox. More than logic has suffered, as originally conceived, the jurors were to be a kind of safety valve, a way to soften the bureaucratic rigidity of the judicial system by introducing the common sense of the community. If they are to function effectively as the conscience of the community, jurors must be told that they have the power and the right to say no to a persecution in order to achieve a greater good. To cut jurors off from this information is to undermine one of our most important institutions. Perhaps the community should just educate itself. Then citizens called for jury duty could teach the judge a needed lesson in civics. This information is designed to bring to your attention one important way our nation's founders provided to ensure that you, not the growing army of politicians, judges, attorneys, and bureaucrats, rule this nation. <clears throat> It will focus on the true power you possess as a juror, how you got it, why you have it, and remind you of the basis on which you must decide not only the facts placed in evidence, but also the validity or application of every law, rule, regulation, ordinance, or instruction given by any man seated as a judge or attorney when you serve as a juror because the jury is the real judge and they can acquit regardless of whatever laws men might make that's the power that we have that they're hiding from us and all this tyranny could end if people would just say no and stop convicting innocent people who haven't harmed somebody because that is the common law if there's no injury there is no crime All right, to continue here. It says one juror can stop tyranny with a not guilty vote. He can nullify bad law in any case by hanging the jury. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I should do. And with the help of Elohim, I will do. Everett Hell. Now, the issue that we have now is you can't even be on a jury without being registered to vote. And the voting is for a system that's corrupt and usur usurping the constitutional republic. So there's some things that need to be fixed before we can have real common law juries, common law trials. But outside of that system, or within that corrupt system, people can still vote not guilty. We can start fixing things if they just grew a backbone and learn the rights. <clears throat> Outside of that system, 
we as the people can and should form grand juries and start investigating and indicting these criminals for violating the constitution it is punishable by death and if we start putting their feet to the fire at the very least they'll start doing what they should or suffering the consequences that's the reason why it was such a stark thing and they got if you look at what Carl Miller shares about it in the statutes they had in place, the punishment for treason was originally to be hung by your neck at high noon until evening and then taken down and buried. The exact punishment for uh, someone who's cursed in scripture. This is the only power the judge ha has over the jury is their ignorance. <clears throat> We, the people, must relearn a desperately needed lesson in civics. The truth of this question has been answered by many testimonies and historical events. Consider the following. Jury writes. The jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the fact in controversy. John Jay, first Chief Justice. United States Supreme Court. 1789 and i'd like to remind everyone if you didn't know you can look this up for yourself it was this very year in 1789 that george washington petitioned and worked with congress to have passed the uh, education bill where it said that every american ought to be educated in the bible and it was required by law what they're doing with education now is criminal and against what was previously established. But that's been going on against, like, again, since the 1960s, the second, the second Vatican Council, the continuation of the Reformation from that with the ecumenical movement and all the atheism pushed in through the variety of theories and other things that were taught contrary to scripture. But that's for another time. However, our country was established that we were to be taught the Bible and nothing else was established by law and the consent of the people. <clears throat> it says the jury has a right to determine both the law and the facts. Samuel Chase, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1796, signer of the unanimous declaration. The jury has the power to bring a verdict in the teeth of both law and fact. Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court Justice 1902. The law itself is on trial quite as much as the cause with which or which is to be decided. Harlan F. Stone, 12th Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court, 1941. <clears throat> The pages of history shine on instance of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard instructions of the judge. U.S. v. Doherty, 473 F. 2nd, 113, 1139, which was a court case in 1972. Law of the Land the general misconception is that any statute passed by legislators bearing the appearance of law constitutes the law of the land. The Constitution, or sorry, the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And any statute to be valid must be in agreement. This is the key, okay? Anything to be valid must be in agreement and cannot be contrary to the supreme law. Anything made contrary to the supreme law is void. And we're about to get to that, okay? But what we have going on is a slew of things that were passed, not only ratified or not properly ratified, but added as amendments to the Constitution, but legislation and statutes that are separate from it that are completely repugnant to it. And because they put these things in there, they're void. We, the people, just have to realize what's going on and no longer allow it to continue. 
And that's not treason, that's using our lawful government the way it's meant to be. As you'll see a quote from Abraham Lincoln here coming up. <clears throat> but it says, it is impossible for a law which violates the Constitution to be valid. This is succulently stated as follows. All laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void. Marbury v. Madison, and that was a court case in 1803 with James Madison as the defendant when he was the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State. But he was sued because he would not appoint Marbury as a judge or a, a justice of the peace, if you will. For a little background, if you guys aren't familiar, jo John Adams was leaving his office of pres presidency. Thomas Jefferson was just coming in. At this point in their history together, they were at odds because they were running against each other and there was some friction and tension between the two. They actually did not start communicating again until they were reunited by a gentleman, I can't remember who, and I believe that was around 1812, and they were in communication again up until 1828 with their death. They were both poisoned by Jesuits on the same day. Which the curse of the 4th of July death of patriarchs of our country is something that they planned out. They tried to do it over and over again. But a few people kept surviving the poisons and whatnot. <clears throat> However, to get back to here, this court case, Marbury versus Madison, has never been overturned. And it was used for over 130 years to prove and assert that we have the right or that anything that was made contrary to the Constitution is void. All right. So continue real quick. It says, where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. And that's a quote from the court case Miranda versus Arizona. You might be familiar with this from what they call your Miranda rights. It used to be required that a police officer would read you your rights before they would have any interaction. That was later overturned or overruled by other judges in appellate course, courts, but that's contrary to what they call say uh, stare decisis, which is Latin for what has been decreed. In common law, the judges don't have the right to do anything but follow what has already been decided in previous rulings in the matter because it's the common law and will of the people that are being fulfilled. When you have the right of the people and they're being let, let know what they have the rights to do or not do, you can't take that away and just pull the carpet out. But this is what they did through their admiralty law court system. That's why you don't have your Miranda rights read to you until you're sitting in an interrogation room. <clears throat> but really, you should not talk to them ever. Not to be mean, I, I have nothing against police officers, but they literally are trying to enforce statutes contrary to our Constitution and contrary to your best interests. They're looking for ways to enforce statutes on you. They're not looking to help you do what is right. And it's a, it's a tragic thing, but it's the way they're taught. That's why they flushed out the highly educated, um, higher IQ individuals from those positions. They've been using social sciences and other things against the people also for a very long time. <clears throat> it says an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no right. It imposes no duties, affords no protection. It creates no office in its legal contemplation. Or it is in its legal contemplation as inoperative as though it had never been passed, Norton versus Shelby County. The general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and the name of law, is in reality no law, but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose, since unconstitutionality 
dates from the time of its enactment, and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it, meaning that every so-called assault weapons ban or gun ban or any regulation that restricts the right of the people that shall not be infringed is void from enactment. And there's other rulings that can say you can ignore them with impunity. There is no crime for that. It's only because people are ignorant that we keep suffering. And the people that are as jurors don't know that they don't have to say guilty. Okay. No one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law. And no courts are bound to enforce it. That's from 16th American Jurisprudence. Right. A summary of the Ten Commandments, and this is the common law, just so you can get it. <clears throat> I think we'll read this part and have, wrap it up after that, okay? It says, the Ten Commandments represent Yah's government over man. Elohim commands us for our own good to give up wrongs and not rights. His system always results in liberty and freedom. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are built on this foundation, which provides for punitive justice, meaning the common law functions under what you need a bloody plaintiff. If there is no injury, there is no crime. And if there is no injury, there is no way you can put someone under trial to punish them for anything which means all of these tickets for whatever, these infractions for violations of statutes when you have not cost anyone their personal bodily health, their character, or their property, then it's not a crime and you're just willingly submitting to something that you don't have to or unwillingly being subjected to what you don't have to be. But again, it's our ignorance that is the cause of that. Father willing, we can all take this, not just believe what I say, but test it. Read the Constitution. It is the supreme law of the land. Learn it. Read what the founders read, which was what this is all about, what we're going to be doing with this little section for the YouTube. But read what they read. Read what they said. Read what they thought. And then... Let's start actually putting it into practice and get these people, these criminals, out of office. This is, it is not until one damages another's person or property or their character. People, they keep overlooking that, but you'll find in the Torah that you're not allowed to defame others. You can't bear false witness, which perjury is a crime, right? But you can't bear false witness. You can't defame or murder someone in the eyes of another without reprobation, without remedy in our common law system. Most people, we don't get that anymore because there's a lot of blasphemy, ignorance, and evil speaking of one another, but that's a crime. So it's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> this is not until they damage another's person or property or character that he can be punished. The Marxist system leads to bondage, and Elohim's system leads to liberty. Read very carefully. Now, the first commandment is, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you up out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones before my face. You never make for yourself a carved image of anything and a likeness of that which is in the Shemaim above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters beneath the earth. You never bow down to them or serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, a jealous El, visiting the inequity of the fathers onto the children to the third and fourth of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not lift up or bear and carry eth the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to not a lie, falsehood, fabrication, or ruin. For Yahuwah does not purify or cleanse the one who lifts up eth his Shem 
to a lie, not falsehood, fabrication, or ruin. Remember Yom HaShabbat to keep him set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your works, but the seventh is a Shabbat to Yahuwah your Elohim. In it you shall do no work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For within six yamim, or days, Yahuwah made the Shamayim in the earth, the seas, and all that are in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore he set it apart unto all ages, and he commanded us to guard Yom HaShabbat, so that we and our sons and our daughters and our manservant and our maidservant and our ox and our donkey may rest and refresh ourselves. Honor eth your father and eth your mother, so that it is well with you and your life is prolonged in the land Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you to possess. You never murder. You never commit adultery. You never steal, you never bear false witness against your neighbor, and you never covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you covet your neighbor's house, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. And that is the crooks or the, the main meat and potatoes of the common law. You're not keeping those you're in violation of our constitutional republic very in a very literal in a very lawful sense so you're not just sinning against your creator but you're sinning against the established covenant that we have with him which is the government of our country but with that being said i just finished real quick with these last two quotes and we'll we'll call it good it says Directly above the chief justice chair is a tablet signifying the Ten Commandments. When the Speaker of the House in the U.S. Congress looks up, his eyes look into the face of Moshe. The Bible is the book upon which this republic rests. Andrew Jackson, seventh president of the United States. And here's the last quote. It says, the moral principles and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Noah Webster, who is known as the father of American education. All right. But uh, thank you for your time and allowing me to share this. We'll continue with a summary of the Communist Manifesto and, and on next time. And Father willing, get, get a hold of one of these books if you can, or a whole bunch of them. Read them, correct his name and title, and hand them out to people for their benefit. Thank you all. You have a wonderful week and Yahuwah loves you.